In this deer sig video, the sensor is staring at a point in the ground as we slowly circle or orbit around that uh, focal point. The scene starts with the sun roughly behind us over our left shoulder, and as we orbit, we move closer and closer to the sun being uh, in our face or ahead of us, such that we're looking at a roughly right angles to the solar illumination. If you look carefully at the scene, you'll see vehicles uh, driving around carefully. Looking carefully, you can see the vehicles underneath some of the trees, uh, the penetration through the trees. But the most important part of the video is about to show up where we recycle back to the uh, initial image, and you'll notice the dramatic change in the color and illumination characteristics. So we just flipped back to the beginning of the, the scene, and you'll notice that the uh, initial image is quite a bit bluer and hazier. This is, a, this is because of the scattering properties of the atmosphere, which Deersig automatically incorporates into every scene. As this image comes to an end in a moment, you'll see that I've inserted the original image up in the top right corner, the original, the start of this video, so that you can see, in contrast, the dramatic change in the illumination conditions. This is enabled because we fixed the gain on the sensor that's being simulated in DeerSig, so that instead of automatically adjusting for the illumination conditions, it stays in a fixed mode. Getting back to today, John Schott is the Frederick and Anna B. Weedman Professor in RIT's Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science. He's the founding director of the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Laboratory at RIT and a part of NASA's Landsat Science Team. Today he'll discuss his early work at RIT that laid the cornerstone for the university's imaging science program, connecting the Rochester imaging community as well as the national community. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, just truth in advertising, I'm no longer, thankfully, the uh, Frederick and Anna B. Weedman professor. I uh, retired from the uh, teaching part of the university a year ago, so I'm now just a uh, research faculty member. And I'm going to try today to uh, I get this set up, to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the Center for Imaging Science at at RIT, and uh, I don't know if I can. We turn, I'll, I'll turn, do it so I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the uh, about the Center for Imaging Science and how the Center for Imaging Science at RIT came into being and uh, influenced, in many ways, the evolution of the university. At the same time, how the local community and the national community influenced the coming into being and the evolution of that Center for Imaging Science, and hopefully how the center has in many ways influenced the, uh, the local community and the national community, largely through our students, but also through uh, our research. Uh, a couple of the, the key players are, uh, are sitting here, and you'll hear some more of the stories we go along. The left-hand side is, is Willem Brouwer, who uh, helped bring the center into being, and uh, Rich Rose, who was the president of the university through most of the formative years. I'm going to talk to you mostly about the, the 80s and the 90s. I, I think the last 10 or 15 years is a little too recent to, tell, to talk about them as history. So I'm going to talk to you more about the, uh, the formative years uh, of the 80s and the 90s. And I'm going to periodically uh, steal things from some of the literature, so I'm not making all of this up. Uh, and I'm going to go back uh, a little bit in history to, to warm things up. Uh, with some, some data that I stole from a, a lecture that uh, Bill Shoemaker gave about the, uh, the School of Photography, because that's where the roots of imaging science are. And uh, let me start with an anecdote. This whole talk is mostly anecdotes. Uh, how did I meet Bill Shoemaker? When the university was interviewing me, I came from uh, a think tank in Buffalo. It had spent eight or nine years doing uh, contract research. 
and uh, came in to talk to them about some work I was doing at the time for NASA to uh, let them take a look at me and, and vice versa. So I came in and I gave my talk, big stack of uh, transparencies or foils as we called them in those days, and that's you know, sort of how you, you briefed particularly in the government. And uh, so I came in, they found me an overhead projector, and I gave my talk. And uh, a, a group like this, except they were all fuddy-duddy professors, and uh, at the end of the talk, Bill raises his hand and he says, uh, could you write your name on the board? <laughs> and, you know, I looked at him for a minute and then, you know, I said, you know, the old fart, he just forgot who I was, I should go write my name on the board. So I go and I write my name on the board, and as I'm lifting up the chalk, was chalk, to, uh, to do that, I'm thinking, you know, he knows what my name is, he wants to see if I can do a chalk talk on the board, because I'd given my whole talk with, with slides. And any of you who know me know my writing is absolutely atrocious, and so I carefully printed John Schott and uh, must have done it well enough that they decided to hire me. But that was my, that was my introduction to, uh, to Bill Shoemaker, who was the director of the photography school, and turned out to be quite a great guy. I, I enjoyed him thoroughly over the years. We worked together for several years. So some of this early stuff I stole from the... Uh, the lecture he gave. And photo science, which is the predecessor to the imaging science program, had as its predecessor photo technology. So starting in the 30s, we taught photographic technology at RIT. It wasn't until the 60s that we offered a baccalaureate. And it wasn't until quite a bit later, another 10 years, that we offered the master's degrees, but one of the things I want to the high, notice here, I'm not going to read all these charts to you, you can, you can see, I've highlighted the critical stuff from the underlining and you can read while I babble. Where did the interest in photo science come from as we evolved it over the years from mid-60s we had the master's in photo science, that was several years by the way before we had an MFA at RIT, so we were doing the science before we were doing the art. It was, to, it was to train craftsmen in the very earliest days, but by the mid-60s, you know, you didn't need a master's degree to put coat film uh, in, the, uh, in the Kodak uh, manufacturing plants. Why were we, we doing some of that? Well, here's part of the story, uh, as, as uh, told by Bill, and much of the story we, we can tell better now, because they've declassified some of the stuff. The, uh, there, was a, there was a push from the Air Force, in particular, to better educate students to deal with film and photography. And RIT didn't do any research at this time with people who consulted to most of the uh, industry and large government organizations, but we really didn't do much research. We moved out to the, the new campus. Went backwards. Oops, thank you. So we, we formed the uh, the photo science program in the 60s. We changed the name to Photo Science and Instrumentation, which, by the way, was the name when I joined the place. This is why the in, in, interest in photographic technology from the Air Force. The Air Force and the CIA, in the late 50s, started a program that was called Corona. It was disguised for the world under the... Uh, the Discoverer program, which was a NASA program for early rocketry testing, but periodically, actually more than periodically, often, the capsule up here would not have a monkey or whatever else NASA was testing. It would have a film camera that would, in the early days, was built, built by iTech. We'll come back to iTech periodically. Uh, but the film and the transport mechanisms and the developing and the reproduction of all that film was done here in, uh, in Rochester. And the Air Force and the CIA, who jointly ran the Corona program in that era, were very interested in having more skilled people who understood this entire technology, from the optics, the film, the data processing, the image quality, and they were encouraging RIT to do more of this stuff. And so the photo science program, uh, the Masters in Photo Science in particular, evolved out of that uh, encouragement. 
Let me jump ahead now to the mid-70s when I got involved in this whole process. As I mentioned, I was working in Buffalo at a, a contract research house doing remote sensing, and uh, I had convinced uh, Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories, Cal Caltrans Corporation today, to send me to graduate school in Syracuse. So I was going to, to Syracuse a couple days a week to study, to work on my PhD, working in Buffalo, racing back and forth on the thruway, and would periodically stop in Rochester to see my youngest sister, who I'm going to pick on because she's here, so that's why these stories about my, my baby sister. And uh, she was dating a, uh, a fellow at the time, and I stopped one, one evening, and they said, you know, we're going to a party. And so we, we went off to this party, and uh, it was all photoscience uh, students, and Ron Francis, who was the head of the photoscience department, and he and I got chatting, and I told him about remote sensing, and he, all, he perked up and got very excited about uh, remote sensing. And would I talk to him when I finished my degree, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I, we were having beers, and I forgot the whole conversation. So a couple more years go by, and I finished my PhD. And uh, my sister's husband, also photoscience, different guy, uh, <laughs> mentions to Ron Francis that I had finished my PhD and was, was back in Buffalo working full time. So very long story short, uh, I end up coming to, uh, to Rochester to, uh, to interview for a uh, position with Doc Francis. And uh, Ron, Ron was uh, a comedian, as you might see. He, he was extremely beloved uh, by his students. And uh, I, I interviewed, I told you the story about Bill Shoemaker, but I interviewed with, with this crew. Ron was a, a photochemist, very good photochemist, did a lot of work uh, with the, uh, the CIA on film and film issues. He also worked on the uh, Kennedy assassination films, a lot of consulting. Uh, Al Rickmers was a very good statistician, did a ton of consulting on statistics and quality control, which was very big at this time. If you wanted good imagery, you had to have good control of your film and processing system. Uh, Bill Shoemaker was a generalist in, in photographic science. Uh, John Carson was an optician. Uh, Larry Scarf was one of our own students who uh, would leave us shortly after I started to move on to ITEC, and Ed Granger was at Eastman Kodak, and he did uh, linear systems theory and was a, a master at, uh, well, everything, if you asked him, but particularly a master <laughs> at, uh, at image quality. I, I knew somebody in the audience would know it. Uh, so this was the crew that I joined. And when they were interviewing me, they were talking to me about how they wanted to put together a doctoral program, how they wanted to grow research and expand their research, and how they had a lot of pressure to uh, to hire somebody in remote sensing because a lot of the people that they were dealing with, both in the local community and nationally, wanted their graduates to have more exposure to aerial and satellite imaging, which was my connection to this whole thing. By the way, there's a bias in this story about the center of remote sensing. That's where I come from. You'll see why as I go through that there's a good reason for some of that bias, uh, but it's clearly a biased story. If one of our astronomers told us, you'd get a slightly different uh, story. So they hire me in 1980, and within about a year and a half, all these guys are gone. Now you notice the start dates are out in there, many of them had been around for a while, but they, they uh, abandoned the uh, program as far as I was concerned, having just started at this program, and Ron and Ed, were all, and myself, were all that was left after a, uh, a year or so. And so I'm hanging out in this uh, photo science department saying, if I, have I made a bad move in, uh, in moving down the, uh, the thruway 60 miles? And so we're at a point where trying to do new things. Most of these guys didn't have PhDs, by the way, which I think is part of the reason they, they moved on. Uh, they didn't see the, themselves fitting in a, a doctoral program. And also Ron Francis could be a little hard to get along with uh, with, uh, with some of the story. <coughs> So we're, we're at a juncture of starting over. We're, I'm there to, to do research, to change a program that did essentially no research to start to do some research, wondering if I should stay. Well, it turns out in 1981, so within uh, 
actually six, eight months of me coming to the university, I won a large grant to do work for NASA on the Landsat series of, uh, of satellites. And these opportunities to be a principal investigator on a big NASA program don't come very often. So I said, you know, I'll, I'll stick it out and work this project anyways and, and see where things go. Uh, and in the process, realized that, you know, we really did need more advanced graduate students because we were doing pretty sophisticated work and the master student typically was there for a year or so and disappeared and weren't around long enough or got get involved enough in the process to be as useful as you might like to do state-of-the-art uh, research. I, I'm going to do a segue here. I left myself a note to remind me. Uh, so this is 1980. We started working on what was then the Landsat 4 program, the first of the uh, the advanced uh, technology Landsats. Within the last two weeks, I've just been notified that we've won $3 million worth of new work to work with Landsat on the current Landsat, which is eight, and to help them design uh, Landsat 9. So this is a program that's been linked to RIT for uh, decades, literally, and we're now more involved than ever with NASA on the, uh, the design and building of the, uh, the new instruments. So that was, matter of fact, it was exactly a week ago today, I was sitting on, on my computer, and I got an email from this woman at the U.S. Geologic Survey telling me my contract was approved. And I got up and did the happy dance. <laughs> <coughs> Oops, thank you. I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. So we hired some new folks to fill in for all these, these people who left. And luckily for us, one of them was this crotchety Dutchman, Willem Brouwer. Willem was born in the Dutch East Indies. He went to Holland to get his university education, got trapped in the middle of the Second World War. His wife concealed him, his now wife, or then wife, concealed him, uh, didn't go into the uh, workforce the Nazi occupying workforce. Uh, she was awarded medals by the Queen uh, for her work in the underground. And Gillen, when things settled down in Europe, finally did get his uh, doctoral degree in optics, eventually came to the US, worked at ITEC, name comes up again, and eventually came to us after he had retired. So he's a, a crotchety SOB at this point. And, uh, pardon my French. Uh, he, he came to work with us uh, to do optics. So he commuted. Tetchy, his lovely wife, stayed in Boston, their, their home in Lexington. And uh, Bill was just bored with being retired. So he came and, and worked with us, taught optics. Uh, he's he's uh, one of the pioneers of optics. Everybody today knows that he described all optical propagation, propagation with matrices. Well, Bill wrote one of the first books on uh, using matrix math to do optical propagation. Well, he was a finagler and a conniver, and uh, here we are in this photo science school, and the president of the university, Rich Rose, who I mentioned, was an ex-Marine Corps general. His aide de camp was an Air Force colonel, former Air Force colonel in the intelligence side of the Air Force, and they find out that Willem's working with us and his connections to ITEC, and they've been approached also by the Air Force to do more with this imaging stuff. And Willem, working with some of us, comes up with this concept of taking photoscience a major step forward and forming a national center for imaging science that will do research at the national level and utilize his knowledge and connections to folks in Washington to help spin us up. Well, these two guys in the management at the time thought, this is a pretty cool idea. You know, we've, we've been hearing a lot about this stuff and uh, Maybe we ought to do this. So in the mid-80s, 1985, we formed the, uh, the Center for Image Science, which basically meant in the early days, we changed the name of the Photographic Science Department. I mean, it was, that, that, was, that was essentially what happened. We, we pulled it out of the photo school, and so instead of reporting to the director of the photo school, we reported directly to the dean. Phil was a little unhappy about that. He wanted to report directly to the provost. Uh, and. Uh, as I say, he was a crotchety character, and within six months, he resigned as the director. So we spun up the program, set up 
the Center for Imaging Science with Villem as the director, and then he was uh, a little cranky with the management and, uh, and resigned. Hung around and kept teaching optics with us, just couldn't deal with, with the people very much. Well, most of, the, most of the people in the room are old enough to remember, but I'm going to remind you, here we are in the 1980s. How did you do business? We looked at images on light tables. Okay. So the whole world was a piece of film on a light table. Matter of fact, this image is pretty sophisticated. It's a piece of color film on a light table, whereas an awful lot of the film at the time was black and white film on light tables. If we, that, that young man, by the way, is now not such a young man and is a major player at, East, at uh, I was going to say Eastman Kodak, but at Excellus, the government systems uh, side of, of Eastman Kodak now. If we wanted to get sophisticated, we digitize a image. And we take an old microdensitometer and put motors on it and scan the microdensitometer and get an image from a microdensitometer into a computer. This young man is now at RIT, one of our faculty. The problem was, what the hell did you do when you got an image, a digital image, into the computer? In the mid-1980s, if you were lucky, your computer had a display where you could see the text that you typed in. You could not see an image. And so if you had a digital image in a computer, you would do stupid stuff like this. Print it out and color in the numbers to try and figure out where the lakes were, what, was, what you were looking at. It was an absolutely horrible time to think about digital imagery. By the way, digital imagery was not new. As early as 1972, those Landsat satellites I talked to you about, the first one launched in 1972, it downlinked digital data because it was easier to downlink cleanly bits rather than analog signals. But the first thing we did with it when we got the bits down was write it out as film because the only thing people could look at or interact with was film. So this was the era that we were living in in, these, in the mid-80s here where we knew about digital stuff, but it was really kind of hard to work with digital stuff. So I spent a bunch of the resources from the government contracts I had at the time as well as any money I could scrounge from RIT and bought a digital image processing system. The computers cost $20,000, $20,980, a lot of money. These digital image display systems cost $40,000. So now I got $60,000 invested in the ability to display a 512 by 512 digital image. That image is a piece of crap compared to what any of you could take a picture of me with with your, with your phones right now. Okay, so your phones are far more powerful than this. You could display them on your little displays on your, on your phones. $60,000 to get that kind of technology in the mid-80s. But we could interact with digital images. We thought we were in heaven. And this was the start of moving from film to digital in the Center for Imaging Science. Well, I had this digital image processing system and nobody else did, because nobody else had $60,000 in their hip pocket. And so we had what I thought of as a going into business sale, and we did everything for anyone who had images who needed to manipulate them in, in computers. So I'm a remote sensor, but at the center we were doing all kinds of other stuff as well. Uh, we did work with Rochester Gas and Electric and uh, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority and did heat loss surveys with thermal infrared instruments flying over the city and thermal infrared, infrared instruments driving around in vans and took that to people to promote energy conservation, very large programs in, in the 80s. We did work with Johnson & Johnson uh, on skin care and uh, this was for aging creams, trying to quantify the impact of aging creams, trying to quantify the impact of uh, sunscreens, so we sunburnt all sorts of students. This was before they had all the rules about not torturing students. Uh, we, we worked with the University of Rochester and the uh, Hart Institute at uh, Birmingham, Alabama to do early work on echocardiography and trying to do three-dimensional reconstruction of, of echocardiograms. Again, because they would record the data in video and we could video digitize the data and put it in these machines and be able to interact 
in ways that they couldn't with these very early uh, images. And we did work with the, some folks down the road in Buffalo uh, at Harrison Radiator, the Harrison Radiator version of uh, GM, again, looking at thermal stuff, the, the emerging or the building of uh, a radiator. So all of this crazy stuff because we had the tools. Well, we've got a little bit of research going. We've got a Center for Imaging Science in name. We thought we should have some more research base and get us something to look a little bit more real. And so we went out to build a building because at, the, at that point we had just a couple laboratories in the old photo school. So RIT uh, managed to get a, a grant from the federal government to build their Center for Microelectronics Imaging, or Microelectronics rather, and they threw in El D'Amato, Senator El D'Amato, many of you will remember him, threw into that piece of pork some extra money to build a building for the Center for Imaging Science. He needed an excuse for that, even though it was pork and senators at the time could do a lot with their pork, he needed a story. Why, why should we build a Center for Imaging Science? Why should the federal government throw a bunch of money into a Center for Imaging Science? Well, it turns out that Ron Reagan's Star Wars program was the talk of the nation at that point in time, and a select panel had just done a study that suggested that in order to make the Star Wars program work, the Strategic Defense Initiative, remember that by that name, it would take every optician and imaging person in the country just to make Star Wars work, which would leave nobody, or Eastman Kodak, Xerox, anybody else in the business, including the defense intelligence folks who weren't in the weapons business but in the intelligence side of things, and they thought, you know, we ought to have some more capability in the country. And this is how Ale D'Amato decided he could justify the Center for Imaging Science. So that came up with the first five and a half million dollars. We raised another three million dollars with contributions from three different Eastman Kodak divisions, from Xerox, and from ESL, that is not Eastman Savings and Loan, that's Electronic Systems Laboratory in, in uh, California, which is a uh, an intelligence community uh, resource that became part of TRW. I want to do a quick aside on microelectronics. Uh, they got the other half of the $11 million. RIT was in the start of opening one of the nation's first microelectronics programs. We at Imaging Science were intimately involved in this because how do you make a microelectronic circuit board? It's basically photography. You take a picture, you project that picture onto a coated emulsion, you develop it, and the wires come out of the process. The microelectronics guys would kill me for that quick description, but basically, <laughs> the process of manufacturing microelectronic circuits is a photographic process. It's more photographic than anything else. Well, at the time, we were the guys with the photochemists. We understood all of this kind of stuff in imaging science. One of the electrical engineers, this fellow right here, Lynn Fuller, was trying to spin up this microelectronics program. Imaging science and electrical engineering jointly offered, almost 50-50, the courses for this new microelectronics program in the early days. Now, after a little while, they hired their own faculty and went off and did their own thing. And people like me were delighted because every single student I produced in the mid-'80s didn't go to work in the fields I trained them to work in. They went to work in the microelectronics field because microelectronics was booming. And they had lots of money and they needed everybody who knew anything about the photographic process. And so 100% of our graduates nearly in the mid to late 80s went to work for the microelectronics industry until the microelectronics program spun up and they could use those graduates and our kids could go back to the industries we, were, we thought we were training them for. What's going on in the big world? Eastman Kodak, in this case, built the Gambit satellites, the Gambit cameras, set the cameras on the Gambit satellites, from 63 to 84. So all through this period I'm talking about, I can now say, I couldn't say uh, then, couldn't say until just a couple years ago, actually, 
Eastman Kodak Corporation, the Government Systems Division of, of Kodak, was building these space cameras. There's lots of drive still for more and more people who understand this imaging technology end to end. 78 successful launches out of 92, if you divide that into the number of years, we were putting up one of these satellites every two and a half months. Nobody knew about it. They were dropping down these buckets of film, two per launch. Remember, we couldn't radio this stuff down. It's an incredibly different world than the world we live in today. The way you got the pictures down was you packaged up the film, you dropped the bucket, a plane flew by and picked up the bucket, snatched the parachute, and you brought the film to Rochester, developed the film, reproduced the film, sent it out to all the people who had to do the analyses. Up to two miles of film, in excess of two miles of film. You saw that kid sitting looking at the picture on the light table? Well, boy, were we excited when they motorized all the advances on those light tables because you had to spin through. I remember sitting in a, in a classified facility, cranking away, because I didn't have one of those nice motorized advances, cranking away through a half a mile of film to get to the picture I wanted to look at. So this was the world that we were living in at the time, just at the transition to digital, still a world that was very much uh, film and film based. So RIT's got research going on, it's got a building in the making. What about that PhD program? <coughs> well, <coughs> academics are pretty stodgy at times, and the people at RIT weren't very convinced that they wanted to have a doctoral program. And so they went through a whole bunch of committees, you can read some of them in the, in the uh, words here. But the critical thing, in my mind, was that RIT was a very strong dean-dominated uh, program at the time. The president had some clout. By the way, we had a relatively new president. He just started in, in uh, 1979. And the deans ran the whole show. And we had a, a problem, a hurdle to get over. RIT had no doctoral programs. I didn't know that when they hired me. I was, two, I was 28 when they were interviewing me. I was a kid. Uh, RIT was a big name school. I was in Buffalo. Everybody knew about RIT. How could it not have a doctorate? I was here. I was working. I was an employee already when I finally figured out they weren't talking just about a doctoral program in photo science or imaging science now. It was the first one in the university's history. They didn't have a charter. New York State did not, had not granted them authority to offer PhDs. So I had to work with the, the powers that be to figure out how do we get a, a PhD approved at uh, the university. So I sat with each of the deans as part of this process, and they told me endlessly, I remember I'm a kid, I was 29, 30 at this point, they told me endlessly how every, all their faculty were opposed, there wasn't a chance in hell they were, they were ever going to approve a, a PhD in, in anything, let alone imaging science. And so I naively sat and talked and listened and talked and listened. And at the end, I said, I said, look me in the eye and say, will you oppose it? You know, after I told them all the good reasons we should have it. Will you oppose the PhD? And I got each one of them to say no, they wouldn't. They'd let their faculty do what they want, but they wouldn't oppose it. Well, the deans were all the power. And so we finally got to uh, the policy council with a proposal from this dean. Dennis was one of the uh, actual supportive ones. He ended up spending a bunch of time at... Uh, Kodak Government Systems. Dennis worked with me to put together a proposal for uh, to change the charter. It had nothing to do with imaging science. It was just to change the charter. RIT was governed by something then called Policy Council. Policy Council was made up of the deans, a few faculty, and a few students. So we finally got this thing in front of Policy Council in the late 80s and got them to agree, again, because the deans wouldn't say no. They didn't all say yes, but they wouldn't vote no, so they either voted yes or abstained, and all of their people from their colleges just followed suit. So we got the thing pushed forward, said yes, RIT should have a, a doctoral program. It was clear it was going to be imaging science whenever it went through. But what did that do? Well, that did nothing, because the Policy Council just sent things to the Board of Trustees. 
Rich Rose was very much in favor of this. He was the president. And Bobby Kohler, I know a few people in the room will remember Bobby Kohler, either fondly or not. There's no neutrals on Bobby. <laughs> Bobby was uh, head of ODE, the CIA, Office of Development Engineering, the CIA. They were the people who built the reconnaissance satellites. Uh, he was president of ESL, that little company I mentioned. Uh, he was uh, a senior vice president at uh, TR Wonderful and eventually a senior vice president at Lockheed. At this point in history, he was on our board of trustees and was a very strong champion and understood fully why it was important to have advanced science and technology going on in imaging science and all aspects of imaging science. Obviously, his interest was in the reconnaissance side, but it was the full spectrum. And he bullied, Bobby's very good at bullying, he bullied the board who were all of the opinion, we're just teaching kids to get a baccalaureate. What do we need all of this stuff for? He and a few of other forward-looking people on RIT's Board of Trustees, along with Rich Rose, finally convinced the board that, yes, we should have a doctoral program. And as soon as they said, yes, we could have a doctoral program, the image science proposal was right behind it. And by 1989, we had a approval for a doctoral program in imaging science. What were we doing? If you can't read those, I'll read a few of these. These are some of the, the uh, reports of the work that we did in this era. So there's some reports to NASA. There's some reports to the Central Intelligence Agency. These were all unclassified reports. They were all in the RIT library. There's nothing uh, covert about any of this. And some work for the Naval Research Labs. We were in serious business working for the big players in the country doing research for them as this all <coughs> came into being. And then all hell broke loose again. Uh, there was a great deal of controversy about RIT's connection to the Central Intelligence Agency. That's a talk for somebody else to give. I'm not going to go into this, except to say there are at least three sides to most stories. And uh, we in the Imaging Science Department did a lot of work for the Central Intelligence Agency. They did the spying for the nation with reconnaissance satellites. We were in that business. But all of our work was unclassified. It was published in the, uh, the open literature. Uh, the downside to this was that, note the headline, by the way, yellow journalism was still very much alive in 1991. There's a, a 1991 date there. Uh, Rich Rose left the university over all the controversy here. I'm, again, I'm not going to go into that story. But uh, we lost a, uh, a strong champion of the Center for Imaging Science. At, at this point. Talking about people for a minute, so let me introduce a, a few other players. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but I mentioned uh, Willem, uh, the first director. He was followed by uh, Bob Desmond. We were very lucky in having Bob Desmond step in. He was a director for a year, but then he was the dean of the college for, I believe, two years, and then he was the provost. Bob, in all these formative years of the center, helped us pave the way to get the faculty lines, the expensive thing around the university is people. He helped us get the faculty lines to grow so that we had enough faculty in position to, to actually operate this doctoral program when it finally came into being uh, in, the, in the early 90s. Rodney Shaw came in. Rodney has a history at, had a history at both uh, Kodak and Xerox, and he was the director for, uh, for six years. Towards the end of those six years, uh, some more controversy uh, hit the university, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Our first graduate, Rich Rose, did not get to hood him. I think it's one of my great regrets that we lost Rich Rose before he had time to, uh, to help us put a hood on the first uh, student to graduate in the doctoral program. This young man was already working with us from Xerox. He was at Xerox at the time. He got his PhD with us. He's not such a young man anymore. You can see by the, the history and the patents he's got there, he's one of Xerox's strongest uh, contributors, and we're, we're very proud of that. Wonderful kid, too. So let me move on a little bit. I'm, I'm going to wrap up fairly quickly here. With the, what I call the, uh, the dark years, uh, towards the end of, uh, of Rodney's, Rodney Shaw's term, there was a, an internecine uh, war going on. 
within the faculty in the center. We had hired all these new faculty to build the Center for Imaging Science. Everybody didn't think the same way. Uh, Rodney was having trouble uh, controlling the, uh, the crowd, uh, and he decided to move on. Uh, we brought in Bob Johnston. Bob was one of the deans that I mentioned. Uh, he and I had struck up a, uh, a friendship because I helped him take some, what did they call them, uh, x-ray xerographs that he had of cuneiform blocks. And these little cuneiform blocks had writing all over the top that you could read. But what they were was really a package. And inside that package was another document from Babylonian times, another document. And they were just the envelope, if you will, for the letter, the record that was inside. And of course, they didn't want to chop these things up to get what was, what was inside. And so Bob had these uh, uh, x-ray xerographs, and we digitized them, enhanced them back in the early days when we had the toys. And he got intrigued with this. And over years, he became more and more interested in imaging. And so when we need somebody to step in and, and run the center for a little bit, uh, he was appointed by Al Simone, who was our new president to run the center and try and control this feud that was going on within, among the faculty in the center. He failed. Uh, he was a great guy, by the way. Good. But it was, it was a tough crew, and he failed. And uh, I had gone on sabbatical in the midst of this, came back, and the place had just torn itself asunder well, in, in the year that I was away. I lost two of my best. Uh, research staff who couldn't deal with the, uh, the turmoil. And uh, El Simone says, I'm shutting this place down, or we're going to get somebody in to straighten you guys out. I think there were some expletives in that particular <laughs> talk that El had with us. And he said, I'm going to let you pick, because we're a university and you guys get to choose. You can choose either Gary Connors, who was formerly the head of Kodak Government Systems, or you can choose Ed Prisbilowitz. It's up to you. One of them is going to come in and straighten you out. Well, I knew Gary, and I voted for Gary, uh, just because I knew him. I didn't know Ed. And uh, the rest of the faculty knew of Gary, and because of his work with Government Systems, didn't want anything to do with them, uh, because this was in the aftermath of the CIA <coughs> blow up. And so we, we brought in Ed Prisbilowitz who is one of the most wonderful men you can imagine, best boss I ever had, uh, still very much involved in, in things here in Rochester. He was uh, chief technical officer at Eastman Kodak Company before he retired and came out of retirement to help us out. Ed worked with us for two years. He very quickly figured out what the problem was and said, we need to fire these four guys. And then he learned about tenure <laughs> and why Bob Johnston had had so much trouble. You can't fire people at the university. So Ed worked for uh, two years to try and help sort things out uh, at the university, uh, became one of my best friends, and uh, strongly championed getting people back together, working cohesively. And uh, by the time he left, there were four fewer people at the, uh, the university. And, uh, but he also had trouble dealing with our management. When you're, when you're dealing with the management and you can't manage, because that's the nature of universities, you can't manage the people, he got frustrated and, and moved on. Uh, Harvey Rohde stepped in for a year, and uh, eventually we got uh, Ian Gatley, who stayed on for, uh, for six years. Meanwhile, the world is turning digital. Kodak builds a camera, the first of what most of us in the business call the civilian spy satellite. We can't talk about the spy satellites. But by 1999, Kodak launches, Iconos launches, a Lockheed spin-off company, launches a Kodak-built spy camera that is unclassified, all digital, digital data, digital downlink, digital processing. We're living now in, in a digital world. What are we doing at RIT? Well, this is back at iTech, that little company in Boston that built the first spy satellites, the cameras anyways. They have a system for testing what new 
digital satellites might do. And it's this cute little facility here where a model builder builds a model of airplanes and toys on the, uh, the ground. You light it up with all of these lights, which represent skylight. One of them is very bright, which represents sunlight. Up in the top of this tower here, there's a digital camera that acquires an image, and it ends up looking something like this. And by changing the properties of that digital camera, you can say, do we want these properties in something we're going to launch into space? We were working with iTech at this time, and the world was changing. We were saying, well, we need to look in more spectral bands, not just the visible. So your model's now got to work in those more spectral bands. It's got to have high infrared response, where it's got, where you just built a tree, but it's hard to put that high infrared signal on a tree when you build it in a model, because that's part of chlorophyll process. And so you'd have to basically glue chlorophyll on the tree to make it work right. We wanted things to work out in thermal infrared, where temperature was important. None of those things worked very well. So at RIT, we put all of this stuff into a computer simulation. So that's an RIT-based computer simulation of the same stuff that iTech was doing. And so RIT got heavily into this simulation process. Those images I showed you as you were uh, sitting before the talk were all from the RIT simulation process. And RIT now owns that business and provides simulation and modeling capability to the government, to aerospace industry. We're sort of out in front in that. Just to give you a, a sense of what's going on at RIT today, we're making a contribution back for all the investment that people have made in us over the years. Oops. Bad thumb. Just to bring you up to date, a few more players. Uh, really, the one I want to highlight here is Steffi Baum, who's been the director of the center for a, uh, a decade and uh, is just announced that she's moving on. She's at the University of Winnipeg this year. And uh, Dave Messenger, who's been head of my remote sensing group for the last uh, few years, is now heading the, uh, the center as an interim basis. To close, I've talked mostly about research. We're very much involved in pedagogy. I just didn't have time to talk about it. In particular, we are experimenting with programs where we take all of our first year undergraduates and tell them we're not going to teach you any imaging science in the classroom this year. But we want you to build an X. Every year the X is different. We say, we'll help you. you come ask us questions, we'll help you. And we challenge them as a group to build a device not a device that exists anywhere. This is an imaging device that someone sees a need for. The recent one we did was some laryngologists at the uh, University of Rochester were having really, they said, you know, we can never figure out whether somebody's, that pipe you throw, throw down somebody's throat, whether it's gonna just slip down or whether it's gonna be really hard. Looking at them, we can't tell, we don't know how to do this. Can you guys help us build a device that would characterize the, the neck and the throat and the muscles and maybe help us out? So we said to the kids, Figure it out. We don't care if they fail. We don't care if they're successful. We, we, we care that they build a device that might work. Whether, the, whether it solves a, a worldwide problem, we don't care. It's the exper experiential learning. So this is the kind of thing we're doing, experimenting with, uh, with pedagogy. And the reason we do that, by the way, is because they're stupid. They don't know any imaging, and we can't get them to do any, any imaging until they learn calculus and physics and all sorts of other tools. And so we always sort of gave them these watered-down courses their first year, and we were wasting our time and their time, and we said, this is a great experience for them to learn how to do experimental science. We do all kinds of stuff. I won't drag you through it all. Some really neat stuff that's been in the news a lot lately is a spin-off from that early archaeological stuff that I was mentioning we did with Bob Johnson. We have people who do nothing but their research in trying to read ancient documents, trying to understand what's in all sorts of ancient texts. The most recent one uh, was work trying to read the uh, ancient map that they believe Columbus would have used and would have had access to when he set off on his journeys. The kids go everywhere. Our graduates are among the most sought after in the world. And they go to work for all of the big government organizations, all of the aerospace industries, and all of what we think of as the traditional optics and imaging industries. Those are just places for the last couple of years of, uh, of graduates. 
And I want to thank you for your patience. I know I ran a little long. It's a very long story. Uh, that, by the way, is one of those capsules that got ejected out of a, uh, a satellite and was picked up by a, a plane flying by with a hook, grabbed the parachute, pulled it in, is at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, it just happens to be a, a shot of, of uh, myself and Mike Richardson, who was at Eastman Kodak and now works with me and makes a lot of the work we do at RIT possible because of his business management expertise. So I'll be happy to answer questions.